and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. And may God bless his word to you. You may be seated. You continue in prayer at this time, asking the Lord to bless the preaching and the receiving of his word, and he would send his spirit to attend to all that we do now for his glory and for his name's sake. So would you please just continue to pray where you're at right now. Father God, I do thank you for what you've given to us. Lord, you have given us the seal of our souls by your spirit indwelling within us. Lord, to illuminate your word and the working out of your spirit, Lord, every day of our life, Lord, to show us the greatness of Christ. Lord, may that be this morning, Lord, that you send your spirit to give unction to the preaching of your word and open hearts to receive your word. Lord, that we would see and understand what it means to be in the school of Christ. Lord, that he is our teacher and he is the subject and he is the one within whom we understand and within whom we celebrate, Lord, the blessings that we have protected and provided for. Lord, through the shepherd and guardian of our souls, your son. Lord, through the one who paid the price on the cross for our sin. Lord, that he is our propitiation, that he is our advocate. He is the one that stands beside us, Lord, with the power of the Holy Spirit in every aspect of life. We thank you, Lord, that you've granted to us a shepherd in your son and a spirit to seal us and guide us and, Lord, to empower us in all things that we need to do. So I ask that you would please send your spirit now, Father, to be upon the preaching of your word and the reception of it. Father, that you would be glorified through all this. So please remove our sin, Father. Give us a clear mind and conscience to come this morning to hear your word proclaimed, to praise you for it, and Lord, just to ponder the greatness of who we are in Christ, to ponder the greatness, Lord, of what you've taken us from and transferred us into, into the kingdom of your beloved Son. So please, I ask, Father, please, that you would help us to know Christ more today and every day that we walk this earth, that you would be glorified in that. So please, Father, exalt Christ in our midst and be glorified through that, through the empowerment of your spirit. We ask this so that you, Father, would receive all glory, praise, and honor. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul has come to a position where he's flipped over the pancake. I just went to Montana, and if you get a pancake in Montana, just order two. That's all you need. They're about that big, okay? Um, you order three, and you're never going to finish those things. But here, what I want to say is, is the but is very instrumental. At the beginning of chapter, at verse 20, he says, but. He is flipping something over. He is showing you something else now. He has just delineated in the, in the first three verses there, in 17, 18, and 19, as we looked at this section. Remember, I chopped this up for you last week. One, the first three chapters are all about the beautiful theology of our salvation. They're, they show us the beautiful benefits, the spiritual blessings that we have in the heavenly places in Christ, those first three chapters. And then in 1 through 16 of chapter 4, he, he gave us the beautiful picture of the church. That 1 through 16 was a beautiful picture of our salvation being played out in the church. And now he's getting into the application again, uh, as he did through some of chapter 4. But now he wants us to help us to see what does it mean to walk worthy of the calling of Christ. And in 17, 18, and 19 of this chapter in chapter 4, he told us about the condition of man, the cause of that condition, and the consequences of that. And remember we took Romans 1, 18 through the end of the chapter, Romans 1, 18 through the end and we looked at the overlay of that how we suppress how our natural inclination is to suppress the truth of God we just turn our consciences off if we're left to ourselves do you guys realize that if we were left to ourselves we would just sear our consciences we would turn it off and we'd say we want to do what we want to do that's what the world's doing right now. We have a great illustration out in the secular world right now, what it means if we were to follow after that, if we were to follow after darkness. How many of you want your sins to be exposed to the light? I do. I want my sins to be exposed so I can deal with them. 
If they're in the darkness, if I continue to stay in the darkness, I don't get to deal with my sin. But if it's in the light, I get to deal with it. And then God gets to forgive me of that. And I get to deal with that every single day. That's what we want. We want it to be exposed. We want it to be out there. So in 17 down through 18, we read this. He says, so this I say and affirm together with the Lord. Paul was basically saying, these are the words of the Lord which he's delivering to the Ephesian church and to us right now today as those who are in the church. That you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk. He says, you came out of that. Don't go back into that. You came out of paganism. Don't go back into it. You came out of idolatry. Don't go back into it. That's applicable to us today. He saved us from something and we need to rightly evaluate the things that he pulled us out of. We're not here to have people come in here to hear what they want to hear. We're to here to pull people out of the world. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to people, pull people into another realm and another understanding. We don't want to uh, basically say, hey, come on in and join us. We're just like you. We want to say, hey, no, come in with us. We found freedom. Come in here. Come in with us and experience the freedom of your sins being paid for. Come in here and experience another realm of understanding. That's what Jesus told the pilot, Right? Are you a king? He says, yes, but my kingdom is not of this realm or I'd be fighting for it. It's not of this world. It's not here. We don't exist to stay here. We have another place to go to, another realm, another place. So he does, do not go back into these places. Do not go back and be like the Gentiles. You were saved from that. Also walk in the futility of your mind, he says. Think about this. Think about the vanity of the things that they were pursuing. Think about the vanity of the things that you were pursuing before Christ came into your life. Before Christ pulled you out of the darkness of this world. What were you pursuing? Vanity of your mind, vanity of vanities. You got up every day and you worked harder and harder, right? You worked harder and harder to get more and more and more things. Then Christ came in and he gave you a new perspective. He says, no, these are all things that I've given you just to provide for you. Use them wisely. Blessed to be a blessing. How many of you this morning are blessed to be a blessing? You've been blessed by God to be a blessing to others around you. Think about the blessings that God has bestowed upon you that you can give them to other people. You can give them grace and a mind that is not based on vanity or empty. Remember I told you guys, don't empty your minds. Fill it with the things of God. Fill it with the things of Christ. As we get into 20, he's gonna say, you need to go to the school of Christ. So he's, in these first three verses, he's basically said, don't leave your mind empty. Fill it with something. And now he's gonna tell us in 20 what to fill it with. But let's finish up with 18. So that was the, the condition of man, the futility of man and the cause of this being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, not knowing God, because of the hardness of their hearts. They naturally chose those things. They naturally chose to suppress the truth of God. Everyone's born with a conscience. Everyone's born with a knowledge of who God is and you have to suppress it. That's what we learned in Romans 1, 18 through the end of the chapter. And they having become callous, remember we said that's a hardness over, over them and it takes away the pliability of a joint, basically that callousness is something that takes away the ability of the people of God to exercise their spiritual giftings. When we see the word callous there, understand that that is a means by which the world basically takes away the things that they need to, that need to exercise. The ability to serve one another, the ability to love one another, the ability to be in the body. And we look at that word callous there and we say, we want to exercise our spiritual gift. We should want to be flexible. We should want to be able to use our spiritual gift for the benefit of the others around us. If we become callous, if we allow this word, this word to, to hinder us, then we cannot use our spiritual gift because we don't use it. We don't practice it. Have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. Oh, sorry, with greediness. So there is a selfishness. Now Paul's about to tell us something. That is a self-centered person. Anybody... Uh, anybody self-centered this morning here? Anybody thinking of themselves this morning? I, I think of myself all the time, right? What can I do for myself this morning? How can I be happy? How do I do myself? Paul's about to say, but you, but you need to be Christ-centered. But you need to think about it this way. He's just put up a nice, beautiful transition. He said, that's the way of what used to be. The selfishness, the self-motivations, thinking of self as something of the past. Don't go back into self, go into Christ. So when he talks about the mind here, he talks about repentance. Repentance is a changing of our minds. We're thinking differently now. We're thinking differently about what we pursue. We're thinking differently about the desires of our hearts. And again, I always say that. Whenever we talk about desire, we look at Psalm 37, 4. It says, you know, if you delight yourself in the, in the Lord, you can, you can go and follow the desires of your heart. You can follow the desires of your heart if you delight in the Lord. How many of you are delighting in the Lord this morning? Did you come here this morning to delight in the Lord amongst God's people? 
Doesn't it nice when we get together and we sing together? Well, on the last song, you guys can sing a little bit louder, okay? We get together and we worship God together because as a unit, as a body, we're louder, we're stronger. There's more vibrance in us, right? We came here this morning to do that, to be a part of that. He says, but you, but you all, but you all did not learn Christ in this way. How did you learn Christ? There's the gospel is right there. But you, the gospel, but you know the gospel, but you know the death, burial, and resurrection of your Savior. You know the penal substitutionary atonement that you have by faith in Jesus Christ. This morning you sit here knowing that, right? Knowing that. You didn't learn Christ the way they did. You learned Christ in the school of Christ, the subject being Christ. And the word that's used here, this phrase in which it occurs should be rendered literally, you learned Christ. Some translations say you learned about him, but you learned Christ. He's the subject matter. He is the subject matter. We're not talking about doctrine. We're not talking about certain things about the church. We're talking about a person. We learn about Christ. We learn, learn Christ The reason this is extraordinary is that the idea of learning a person rather than a mere fact or doctrine is found nowhere else in the Greek Bible. Here is where Paul has put this together for us, to learn. We want to know about him. How many of you this morning want to learn more about Christ? How many of you want to express your affections for Christ more and more every day? That's what the desire is. That's that's an assurance of your faith too. As we listen to Dr. Joel Beakey, he says, do you want to know Christ more? Do you open your Bible looking for Christ more? Old Testament, New Testament, Psalms, Proverbs, everywhere. Are we looking to know Christ more and more and more every single day? That's what we want. I hope that's what we desire. We desire to see Christ. And it hasn't been found in any other biblical doc- document. What does it mean? Well, it is probably means more than merely learning about the historical Jesus or becoming acquainted with his doctrines. This is James Montgomery Boyce. It is probably to be taken along the lines of Jesus' words when he said in his great prayer to his father, recorded in John 17, this is eternal life. Do you guys know John 17? High priestly prayer, John 17, verse three. We read this. It says, this is eternal life. This is gonna go on forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. This is eternal that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you sent. Isn't it nice when Jesus tells us exactly what eternal life is? To know the one true God and Jesus Christ whom you sent. That is eternal life. Think about that. To know him personally, intimately, more and more. To know him, this is eternal life. How many of you want to just go to heaven? How many, oh, so when you got saved, did you buy fire insurance? How many of you are here just because somebody said, if you don't come to Christ, you're gonna to go to hell. Anybody? I didn't. I didn't go to the summer school, the summer, summer classes. But did it make sense to you? I was asked, pure and simple, does this make sense? Did it engage my mind? Did I understand that I was a sinner and I needed salvation? I had no means by which to do that except for Jesus Christ, his death on the cross, his burial, his resurrection. I needed a savior because I was a sinner. He boiled it down for me. One sin a day. How many of you can just sin once, once a day? Three times a day, okay, we'll make it a little bit easier. Five times, how about just five times a day? Add it up. How old are you? I'm 54. Those scales are just, poof. I came to an understanding. I needed a Lord. I needed to know Jesus Christ, whom he had sent. That's the word he's using there, to know him. So in verse 20 says, but you did not learn Christ this way. You came to know him intimately. If indeed, if indeed you have heard him, I'll stop right there. Have you heard Christ? Now, a lot of people read that and say, they didn't audibly hear Christ. Have you heard Christ today? Have you ever read your Bible and something just hits you? Have you ever read scripture and it just says, this is addressing what I'm going through right this moment. As I have read through Romans 8 and different sections of scripture, it just hits you at that moment. I needed that right then and there. I needed that. That was the spirit of God within you saying, this is for you right now. Was that the voice of Christ? Did you hear him? Did you hear him speaking to you? Maybe not audibly, but with inside of you, you knew that that was there. So he's the teacher in this, but you did not learn the subject matter this way. If indeed you have heard him, he's teaching us every single day. The Spirit of God is teaching us every day. So in this, you see this. You see the subject matter is Christ. The teacher is Christ. He is the one teaching us every single day, bringing us, leading us, guiding us, showing us the truth of who he is, revealing himself, exposing us to him. 
I asked the Sunday school class in equipping hour, what do you know about Christ that's not revealed to you in the word of God? Can you give me one thing that is revealed to you that you know about Christ that's not from the word of God? And that was the response. Nobody had any answers. A lot of people say, well, look out in the creation. We see in the creation the glory of God. We see the glory of Christ in creation. How did you know that? Because the Bible tells you in the Psalms that it's there. If you have heard him and have been taught in him. Some of your scriptures, some of the translations, the NIV will say, have being taught about him. That's not the way. It's en atu. So it would be, and have been taught in him. In Christ. You have been taught in Christ. He is the schoolroom that you go into. Christ is where you go into. It's not about Christ. It's in him. You've experienced every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. You enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ to learn about him from him. Doesn't that blow your mind? You enter into the classroom of Christ. He is the classroom. He is the subject and he is the teacher. That should get you excited. That's what Paul is saying here. You learned Christ this way. He spoke to you. He was the subject matter. And you learned him within his classroom. Everything is displayed around you that is Christ. Everything, everything is about Christ. So we need to fathom that. Paul is basically trying to blow our minds here in the the language he uses here. So I had to look through James Montgomery Boyce, John MacArthur, uh, three other guys to understand what was going on in the Greek here. Because translations want to say this is just about him. No, this is in him. You exist in the sphere of Christ. You exist in Christ every aspect of your life. To get him to know him more and more every day is to take a step. You take a step, you're in Christ. You take another step, you're in Christ. You take a breath, it's from him. Everything revolves about you being in Christ. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ you have been given. Just as truth is in Jesus. Did you notice that something changed there? What does change there? He's been talking about the Messiah and now he's talking about Jesus. Did you notice that? Most of your translations should say that. The Messiah is mentioned in verse 20. But when we get down to verse 21, he says, just as the truth is in Jesus, in the person and work of Jesus, the truth is in him. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He told to Philip in John, in, John, in the chapter, in the gospel of John he says he is the way the truth and the life the truth is in Jesus we want to know truth it's in him before Pilate Pilate asked him what is the truth what did Jesus say nothing the truth was right in front of him the truth of God was standing right there just as truth is in Jesus he is the way the truth and the life we evangelize with that he is the way the truth and the life no one comes to the father but by Jesus in all of this He is the belt that we put around our waist. The belt of truth we put around our waist is Christ. But it's Jesus. It's his human element. It's his incarnation. It's the God-man who came to dwell amongst us. We have to have that. We have to have the one who came and was found in the appearance of man, who humbled himself to the point of death, even death upon a cross. That is whom we celebrate, that he is that truth, that Jesus is the truth. Verse 22, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self. Laying aside the old self. What is involved there? One of the theologians said it's it's as though one of the homeless people, that they go down to the homeless shelter, they have to take off all of their clothing. And that's the idea here. This is an idea of taking off clothing every single day. Taking off our clothing, being cleansed, and being dressed again is the idea here. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as Jesus is the truth, that in reference to your former manner of life, former manner, we don't go back to it. We take it off. We strip ourselves, lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in the accordance with the lust of deceit, that our flesh is no more, that we set it aside, that we put on Christ, put on his righteousness, pursuing him in all things, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Again, this is the idea of our mind being taken captive by the things of God, being captivated by what we learn in the word of God, that we meditate, that we memorize, that we look to the beautiful pictures of Christ in the Old and the New Testament, that our mind is being studying of the word of God, that we look to every aspect of God's word so that we're filled with it and that our minds are filled with the pictures of Christ and the thoughts of Christ, that we have words to give to others in those regards, speaking to each other in spiritual songs and hymns. He'll get to that in five. 
and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self. What is the new self? Putting on the righteousness that's not ours. How many of you are righteous here today? No one? How many of you are righteous in Christ? Putting on the new self, which in the likeness of God, we bear the image of God. We all bear the image of God. Have you ever evangelized with that? Have you ever told somebody, you bear the image of God? Have you ever talked to someone on the street? Anyone out there? Say, hey, I really like the way you dress today. You bear the image of God. Have you ever tried that? Try that sometime. You bear the image of God because everyone on the face of this planet bears the image of God. But do they know him? Do they put on the new self, which is the likeness of God that has been created in righteousness? There's a righteousness that you have that they don't have if you have faith in Christ. If your faith is in Christ, if you have known him, if you've learned Christ, if you, he is the subject matter, if he is your teacher and you revolve in his classroom, then it's easy for you to say, I bear the likeness of God as he's been created in his righteousness. He is the truth, the way, and the life. I'd like to tell you about him because you too have the image of God. You too have a consciousness that if you don't suppress it, you'll know the truth of God. You'll know who he is. Of course, that's the, the working of the Holy Spirit within them. The Spirit must be there being renewed in their mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. What does it mean to pursue righteousness? The righteousness is that reflection. The righteousness of fellow men reflects the second table of the law in Exodus 20, verse 17. How we interact with each other. The righteous duties. How do we interact with each other? A righteousness is only righteousness that Christ has, but how does it be demonstrated in us? It's the outward elements of the second tablet of the law. How do we consider ourselves in relation to one another? How is it working out horizontally? How do we work out that? That righteousness is how we rightfully walk in this life in a manner that pleases God as we deal with each other. The holiness, holiness is the sacred observance of all duties to God relates to God and reflects the first table. The believer then possesses a new nature, a new self, holy and righteous inner person, fit for the presence of God. This is the believer's truest self that he thinks about outward and inward. That there's a righteousness and there's a holiness of the truth. Again, the truth in context here is of Christ. Christ being the truth. Jesus being the truth. Jesus in his flesh, in his incarnation. How he lived his life is our model. To follow him, not just morally, but in every aspect, wanting to be more and more like him. Physically, mentally, spiritually, in every emotion, experiencing what Christ's experiencing. Finding examples of Christ. Following examples of Christ. Looking to Christ to lead us and to guide us to be our shepherd, to be our provider, our protection. The likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Paul is telling us, I have to flip this over now. I no longer want you to walk like the pagans. I want you to walk in a manner that is worthy of your calling. I want you to focus all of your attentions upon Christ, looking to him on the other side of the scales. Can we do that? We can. Remember I told you guys the the weight scales, they flipped like this because you got Jesus on one side and you're sitting on the other side. How can we balance this out? All you have to do is point to Christ. All you have to do is acknowledge him. All you have to do is say, Christ is the one who's done this in my life. By God's grace, I am what I am. Paul has flipped this over for us. Back up to verse 20. But you did not learn Christ. But you did not learn your salvation this way. God came and changed you. God came into your life and took you out of a domain of darkness and transferred you into the kingdom of his beloved son. How many of you are thankful for that this morning? He has taken you out from the authority, the ruling of darkness. He's taken you out from that. You don't want to go back to that. You don't want to go back to that authority and that darkness. He's transferred you into where? Into the kingdom of his beloved son, the one who's being loved. That's where you are now. Do you feel like you're in a kingdom right now? Probably not. There is a kingdom yet to come, but he's transferred you into that. Think about that for a minute. Out of darkness, into light out of a kingdom where you're suffering all of eternity to a kingdom of glory. Glorious things will be revealed to us there. (coughs) Glorious things. If indeed you have learned him and heard him, have you heard him? Have you heard the gospel? When you hear the word proclaimed, when you read the word, when you think about the word, are you hearing it? 
Not just audibly are you hearing it. Does it resonate within your body? Do you read the word of God and does it address you each and every day? Does it talk to you? Does it say, hey, I'm here. Is Christ there? Are you listening to him? Have you been taught in him? Taught what the truth is. Do you have a righteous anger here this morning? How many of you express righteous anger this morning? Okay, unrighteous anger. Everybody would raise their hand. Yes, unrighteous, because I'm self-motivated. Righteous anger is the anger that you express because you see the world is corrupt. You see the things in the world are being corrupted, and it, it, it makes you angry in a good way. Don't, don't express violence, but you have a righteous anger because you want to see these things cleansed. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus, it's in Christ, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of the flesh. There's a flesh that still we still do battle with. Paul tells us in Romans 7, I want to do the things, I don't do the things I want to do, I do the things I don't want to do. You know the issue, right? He's battling with himself in that. That's what our flesh is doing. And that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. What are we filling our minds with? How many of you are filling your minds with the things of the Lord this morning? Meditating. And put on the new self, which is in the likeness of God, has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth, inside and out. Look back over at chapter two. He talked about this earlier. He talked about this whole dichotomy and the flipping and the change. Verse 11 of chapter two. Therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcised by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ. He was telling us back then what it meant to be separated from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. You have hope. The world has no hope. We are not to be in that, in the world, but not of the world. We have a hope which is in Christ. But now in Christ, Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. What did we celebrate in the communion this morning? We're bought and paid for by the blood of Christ. Redeemed, we've been called by name. We belong to God. Verse 14, for he himself is our peace. Who, bo- who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments, contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, one new humanity, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by it having put to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. Christ is preaching. Do we hear his preaching in the Old Testament? For through him both, for through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing in the, into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit." In this section, everything is in the aorist tense. In section 20 through 24, everything is past tense. Everything has been established at a one-time particular point, but we don't leave it there. We continue to grow. He says that because this temple that's being built, this learning center that God has for us is being built. It's growing. It's a dwelling of God in the spirit. It's still growing. How are you growing today? Are you growing? One of the songs, remember, says, how am I growing? How are you growing today? Are you growing because you walk out of this building and you go, I want to know Christ more. For this is eternal life, to know the one true God and Jesus Christ whom he sent. When you leave this building today, evaluate your heart. What is your desire today when you leave this building? Do you want to see Jesus come back today? How many of you want to hear the trumpet? Who wants to hear the shafar horn? Today would be a good day, right? The shafar horn, we should get one and blow it outside and just run around the building. People go, what are they, crazy? Yeah. We want him to come back. Today is a good day. Today is the day of salvation. Today we need to interact with the image of God amongst us who don't know him, whose minds are filled with empty nothingness and tell them about the person and work of Jesus Christ. He is the subject. He is the teacher. 
and he is the classroom. Please take that away today. That's what Paul is telling us. He's the subject. He's the one teaching, and it's his classroom. Let's get ourselves in that mindset. Everything around us, everything where we walk today, it's Jesus Christ's classroom. It's Jesus' classroom. Let's be teaching one another and those around us the beautiful pictures of Christ. No longer than strangers and aliens. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have faith in Jesus Christ here today, this is for you. If you're here without that belief, oh, that you would come to that belief. You have no hope. Your hope is pointless. It's empty. If you're an unbeliever here today with us, you have nothing. Vanity of mind. But if you have faith in Christ today, if you place your faith in Christ, you have all things in him. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your people. Lord, may we be rightly thinking about it this day. Lord, what Paul just presented to us, that Christ is the subject matter, that he is our teacher, and that we are in his classroom. This is all an evidence of his mercy and glory and greatness. Father, please help us to think about that each and every day. No matter what we're doing, Lord, we have to work, we have to labor, we have to sleep, we have to do all the things of life. But Father, help us to be reminded each and every day that we're in Christ's classroom. Help us to put off the old, Father, to continually strip off the old and put on the new, to be putting on Christ each and every day, his righteousness, his glory, pursuing the righteousness and holiness that is his and his alone. So Father, please, may our affections be to Christ in all that we do. I ask for this in Jesus' name, amen.